Welcome to the video lecture on solving equations by factoring and the quadratic formula. So now that we've learned how to factor equations, we're going to use that to help us solve equations. So when we have polynomials of degree 2 or more, the strategy that we're going to use is to remove any grouping symbols, combine any like terms that we see in the equation, and move everything over to one side so that we set it equal to zero. Then we're going to factor so that it has the form a times b equals to zero. Once we get all those terms on one side and set it to zero and factor it, then we can just set each of those factors to zero and solve. And then if we have time, we'll check our solutions. So for example, if we have 16y squared equals to 25, our step one in solving an equation like this is going to be to set it to zero by moving terms over to one side of the equation. Now I'm going to leave the 16y squared where it is and just move the 25 over to the left side by subtracting it. So this would become 16y squared minus 25 equals to zero. And now if I want to finish solving this, this is where we're going to try our factoring. So when you look at this, this has no GCF to it because 16 and 25 don't have any common factors, but it has two terms and 16y squared and 25 are both perfect squares, which means this fits that pattern of a difference of squares. So it should be really easy for us to factor. We're going to set up our two sets of parentheses. And in order to get 16y squared, we need something times itself, and that would be 4y and 4y. And something times itself that gives us 25 would be 5 and 5. And one of these has to be plus and the other one minus so that we don't end up with any middle terms up here. And that's that difference of squares pattern. And these two factors are equal to 0. So now that we have it factored, once you've gotten it factored and set to zero, then we're going to use something called the zero product property, which basically says that the only way two things can multiply to zero is if either the first thing is zero or the second factor is zero. So we're going to set each of these factors to zero and solve for y. So for this one, I would have to subtract the 5 over to the right side and then divide by 4, and that gives me one solution, negative 5 fourths. And for the second factor, I would have to add the 5 to the other side and divide by 4, so that gives me my second solution, 5 fourths. So we get two answers, negative 5 fourths and positive 5 fourths. Okay? So, Let's try that on this next example. Now this one I want you to be really careful of because we get so used to wanting to factor and then setting each factor to whatever that we're tempted to say, oh, well, this left side is already factored. So why don't we just set each of these to something? Well, the problem is we can't set it to zero because there isn't a zero on this side of the equation. And there's multiple, infinite number of ways to multiply two things to equal to negative 21. It's not just 3 times 7 or 21 times 1. There's all kinds of decimals and fractions that would multiply to a negative 21 as well. So this is not something we can work with in its current form. We have to get a zero on the right-hand side before we can finish solving this. So even though the left side looks factored, we have to undo all of that factoring just so that we can bring this 21 and move it over to the left side and get it involved in the game. So what we're going to do is we're going to foil out this left side and get rid of all these parentheses. So I'm going to do x times x is x squared. x times minus 2 is minus 2x. 8 times x is positive 8x. And positive 8 times negative 2 is negative 16. And this is still equal to that negative 21. If I add that 21 over to the right side, then I will get a 0 now on the right side, which is exactly what I'm looking for. And if I combine my like terms, negative 2x plus 8x would be a positive 6x, and negative 16 plus 21 is a positive 5. So the whole purpose of undoing all these um, parentheses is so that we can get something equal to 0. And then we have to put the parentheses back in again by factoring what we now have. 
Now this has three terms, so to factor it we're going to use reverse FOIL, and it's the simpler case because this leading coefficient is a 1, so it should be fairly easy to factor this. So we're going to set up two sets of parentheses, and we're setting it to 0, and the only way to get an x squared is with an x and an x. There's only one way to get 5, and that would be 5 times 1. And if I make the 5 plus and the 1 plus, then the inner and the outer will add to a 6x. So this works. Now don't stop here. Don't stop once you factored it, because this was an equation. So to get the solutions to the equation, now you have to set each of these factors equal to 0. And you should get two solutions. So when I subtract the 5 over, we're going to get negative 5, and when I subtract the 1 over, we're going to get a negative 1. So notice the opposite signs here. The factor had x plus 5, but the solution was negative 5, and this factor had x plus 1, but the solution was negative 1. So here are my two solutions. Okay? So along those same lines, in this next example, we have the same issue. It looks nicely factored, but we don't have this set equal to zero. So unfortunately, we have to undo all of this nice factoring just so that we can move terms over to one side and set it to zero. So we're going to start this problem by foiling the left side and foiling the right side. So 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times 5 is 10x, 1 times x is x, and 1 times 5 is 5. On the right side, x times x is x squared, x times 3 is 3x, 11 times x is 11x, and 11 times 3 is 33. Now let me clean up the left side and the right side just a little bit before I start moving things around. The left side here will be 2x squared plus an 11x plus 5, and on the right side, we'll have x squared plus 14x plus 33. Now, I want to move everything to one side so that I can get a 0. And I prefer factoring with a leading term that's positive. So in order to make the x squared term be positive, that means I'm probably going to want to subtract the x squared term over to the left side. And that means I also need to subtract these other two terms as well so that everything gets moved to the left. So that should give me a big 0 on the right side. 2x squared minus x squared will give me an x squared. 11 minus 14 is negative 3x. And 5 minus 33 is negative 28. Once you have your 0, you're ready to factor. And again, this has three terms with a leading coefficient of 1, so this should be reverse FOIL and it should be the easier case. So I have two sets of parentheses. I need an x times an x to get an x squared. And then I need two factors of 28, two numbers that multiply to 28 that can either add or subtract to give me a negative 3. Well, I know that 28 is 7 times 4, so if I use a 7, and a 4. I need the 7 to be minus and the 4 to be plus so that I get a negative 7x and a positive 4x which will add to a negative 3x in the middle. And I'm also going to get a negative 28 on the end. So this is correctly factored. And now I set each of these to 0. So once you factor, don't stop there. Set them to 0. And then I'm going to add 7, so there's one solution. And then I'm going to subtract 4 and there's my second solution. Okay? Now the next example is a little different. It's got a cube in there, but we're going to do the same process all over again. Step number one is always to get a zero on one side of the equation. So I'm going to subtract that 64 q, excuse me, 64y term over to the left side so that I get a zero on the right side. And now I have to figure out a way to factor this. It only has two terms, so if it's going to factor, it would factor using a difference of squares pattern, but this isn't perfect squares because y cubed and y to the first, those have odd powers. So it's not going to factor as is. So that means we're overlooking something, because I'm not going to ask you one that's not going to factor. So in this case, what we're overlooking is that there's a GCF. I can pull out a y, and that would leave me with 25y squared minus 64. And now that I've pulled out that y, 
I do have a square minus a square left over. So what's left here is a difference of squares pattern. So it will factor, it's two sets of parentheses, I need a 5y and a 5y, and 8 times 8 is 64, one of these is plus and one of these is minus, and it's still set to 0. Now that we're completely factored, we're ready to set to 0. Now don't forget, this GCF has a variable in it, so it has a solution. So we need to set that y to 0, we need to set the 5y plus 8 to 0, and we need to set the 5y minus 8 to 0. We should be getting three solutions because this was a degree 3 equation. So y equals to 0 is already solved, so there's one answer right there, just 0. If I solve this one, I'm going to have to subtract the 8 and then divide by 5. So a second solution is negative 8 fifths. And for the third one, I'm going to add the 8 and divide by 5. So my third solution would be 8 fifths. So there are all three of my solutions. Okay, so if we look at our next example here, this one is already set to zero, so we're ready to jump right in and start factoring. But when you look at it, it looks a little strange. There is no common GCF throughout all four terms, but the key is that there are four terms, which means when you've got four terms, we try grouping. So that's how I'm gonna try to factor this. So I am going to look just at these first two terms and pull out a GCF from just those two. And they both have some p's. And the smallest power of p that they both have is a p squared. So I'm gonna pull out a p squared, and that should leave me with a two and a p from this first term. Plus, if I pull out this p squared, there's not a zero left, there's a factor of one left, because remember, you have to be able to redistribute back to get that p squared. So we need p squared times one to get back to that p squared. So don't forget there should be a one there. Then, if I look at these next two terms, you gotta realize that 98 is 49 times two. So 49 is my GCF, and if I look over here, remember, this is what I'm trying to match, and this doesn't have any negatives in it. So chances are I'm going to need to pull out a negative as well as that 49. And if I do, that'll leave me with a 2 and a p, because negative 49 times 2p is negative 98p. And what do I need over here? Negative 49 times what gives me negative 49? A plus 1. So this is perfect because these two now match. And that means I can pull that out. And in a second set of parentheses, these are now gone, and I'm left with p squared minus 49. Now don't stop there, because p squared minus 49, that has two terms, and 49 is a perfect square, p, is a, p squared is a perfect square, so this will factor some more. So the 2p plus 1 stays put, and then if I factor this using that difference of squares pattern, that would be p plus 7, and p minus 7. And now I set them each to 0. So 2p plus 1 set to 0. I'm going to subtract the 1 and divide by 2. So p equals negative a half. That's one answer. If I set p plus 7 to 0, that's going to give me negative 7. And if I set p minus 7 to 0, that's going to give me p equals positive 7. So there are my three solutions. Okay, this next example, there's no GCF, it's already set to zero, so we should be ready to factor, but since there's no GCF, we count how many terms there are, and there's three, so this would have to be reverse FOIL if it's gonna work. So I'm gonna set up two sets of parentheses, and the powers here are a little bit higher, so just be a little bit cautious here. What times what is going to give me a y to the fourth, but also give me a y squared for that middle term. The only thing that would work there would be a y squared times a y squared. And what times what gives me 16 and adds or subtracts to give me a negative 8? Well, 16 is 4 times 4. It's also 2 times 8, 1 times 16. But the only combination that will add up or subtract to an 8 is the 4 and the 4. 
and I need them both to be minus so that I get a negative 8 in the middle but a positive 16 on the end. Now I'm not done because y squared minus 4, that's a square minus a square. So that's a difference of squares pattern and I actually have it twice here. So each one of these is going to factor some more. So this is going to become a y and a y, a 2 and a 2, a plus and a minus, and likewise this one will also be a y plus 2 and a y minus 2. So when I set these all to 0, y plus 2 equals to 0 when y is negative 2, and y minus 2 set to 0 means y equals positive 2, and then we're going to get that again over here. So we got four solutions, it's just that they repeated. So my answers would be 2 and negative 2. Okay. So now that we have kind of the basics down of how to solve quadratic equations, now we're going to apply them to some word problems. So one very, very common kind of word problem that you will probably see in your homework and on tests are these right triangle problems. So on this problem, we have that the hypotenuse of a right triangle is one foot more than twice the length of the shorter leg. The longer leg is one foot less than twice the length of the shorter leg. Find the leg, uh, excuse me, this should be find the length of the shorter leg. So we're going to draw a right triangle here. And it sounds kind of confusing, but you should all know that the hypotenuse is always the side that's opposite that right angle. And then we have these two legs over here, and one's longer than the other. So, if it says that the hypotenuse of a right triangle is one foot more than twice the length of the shorter leg, which leg, or which side, I should say, do we need to know first? We need to know the shorter leg first, because once I know the shorter leg, then the hypotenuse is one more than twice that. So the shorter leg is what we should be calling the x, and then one more than twice that becomes 1 plus 2x. So that's our hypotenuse. And then the longer leg is 1 foot less than twice the length of the shorter leg. Now be careful of your order here. 1 foot less than means subtraction, but we have to switch the order around because we want 1 foot taken away from twice the length of the shorter leg. So twice the shorter leg would be 2x, and then we want to take away one foot from that. So there is all three sides of our triangle. Now the reason why you see these right triangle problems a lot when you're doing quadratic equations is because you can use something called the Pythagorean theorem to solve this. And what the Pythagorean theorem says is that a squared plus b squared equals to c squared, where a and b are the two legs of the triangle and C is always your hypotenuse. This relationship is always true for every right triangle, no matter the side lengths. So that means these side lengths here have to satisfy this relationship. So I'm going to let A be this X. So I'm going to square that uh, short leg and then I'm going to add to that the square of the longer leg. Now when I square the longer leg, use parentheses. So I want to square that whole quantity, and then I want to square the hypotenuse as well, so I want to use parentheses there also. So this is now a quadratic equation. In order to solve it, however, remember, we have to get a 0 so that we can then factor and set everything to 0. And in order to get a 0 here, I have to undo all these squares, and I have to FOIL out. Don't forget to FOIL when I multiply and square these out. So this x squared stays put, but think about what 2x minus 1 quantity squared means. That really means 2x minus 1 times 2x minus 1. So when you FOIL that out, you're going to get a 4x squared. You're going to get a minus 2x and another minus 2x, which would be a minus 4x. And then you're going to get a plus 1 on the end. For the right side, it's very similar. 1 plus 2x is the same as 2x plus 1. So when I FOIL that out, I'm going to get 2x times 2x, which is, again, 4x squared. But this time I'm going to get a plus 2x and a plus 2x, or a plus 4x in the middle. 
and then a plus one on the end. So that's what I mean by FOIL. Don't forget your middle terms. Now we have some like terms here that we need to combine. So this is going to become 5x squared minus 4x plus 1 equals 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. And we want to get a 0, so I want to move every, everything over to one side. And again, I, I like and I prefer to have a positive leading term. So I'm going to subtract the 4x squared over to the left side which means I also want to subtract the 4x and the 1 as well. Be very careful with your signs here. You should be getting 0 on the right side. 5x squared minus 4x squared is just an x squared. And these are both negative, so they actually add. Negative 4 and negative 4 is negative 8x. But the 1s have opposite signs, so they cancel each other out. So we just get x squared minus 8x equals to 0. So now that we have our 0, we're ready to factor. This only has two terms, but it's not a difference of squares because we don't have a perfect square when we look at that 8x. So we must be overlooking something, and what we're overlooking is that GCF. So my GCF here is just an x. Both of these have an x in common. So if I pull out an x, what would be left is x minus 8. And now if I set these each to 0, I get x is 0, and I get x is 8. Now, in the context of the problem, it's important to go back and remember what x represents. When you solve these equations, it sometimes happens that both of your solutions not, don't necessarily work. And in this case, the x represented the shorter leg, which is what we were being asked to find. So x is going to be our answer. But in the context of this problem, it doesn't make sense for x to be 0, because if x is 0, then we wouldn't have a triangle here. So x equals 0 is not actually one of our solutions. Only the 8 would work. So the shorter leg is going to be 8 feet long, and that would be our only solution. OK. In our next example, this is also another very, very common problem that you're going to see in homework and on tests. So this says, if an object is propelled upward from a height of 48 feet with an initial velocity of 32 feet per second, its height is given by the equation h equals negative 16t squared plus 32t plus 48. So imagine you're standing on a cliff that's 48 feet tall, and you project this ball up into the air with an initial velocity of 32 feet per second. So you're throwing it really, really, really hard. It's going to go up, but eventually gravity is going to pull it back down to the Earth. And so this sort of forms a parabolic shape, a parabola, and that's why this height equation is quadratic, which is the equation of a parabola. So you don't really have to worry about the physics behind this. You just need to know how to use this height equation. So the first part of the question is, after how many seconds is the height 60 feet? So we want to know, when is this ball going to be 60 feet off the ground? Well, in this equation, you either have height, which is your age, or time, which is your t. So in this problem, they're telling us what height to use. So all I have to do to solve this problem is plug in 60 for the height. So I'm going to plug in 60 where h is. And then I have to solve this equation for time to find out when this ball hits 60 feet. So this is the equation that we want to solve. So it's quadratic. In order to solve it, just like all the other ones we've done so far today, we're going to get a 0. So here's a couple of things I want you to notice. You could subtract the 60 over to the right side, and that would easily give you a 0. However, that causes your leading term to be negative which is often something that is more difficult to factor. So if you want to avoid that, you can add the 16t squared over to the left side, 
you can subtract the 32t term over to the left side, and you can subtract the 48 over to the left side so that you get a zero on the right, and now your leading term is positive. And it's just going to make your life a little bit easier to have that leading term be something positive. And 60 minus 48 is going to be a positive 12. Now I have my zero, so I'm ready to start factoring. But before I jump in, please, please, please notice that these numbers are all kind of big, and they're all at least divisible by 2, and in fact they're all divisible by 4. So pull out that GCF first before you factor, because it's going to make that reverse FOIL process much easier if your numbers are smaller and you have fewer choices to choose from. So if I pull out a 4, I'm going to be left with 4t squared. I'm going to have a minus 8t and a plus 3. Now I'm not done because what's left here will factor some more and I can use reverse FOIL on it. So leave the 4 out front and then we're going to have two sets of parentheses. There's a couple ways to get 4t squared, but I know I need at least a t times a t, and either it's going to be 2 and 2 or 4 and 1. And then there's only one way to get a 3, so I'm going to put a 3 here and a 1 here. And now I'm going to list all the ways to get 4 in every potential order. So 2 times 2, or 4 times 1, or 1 times 4. And now I'm going to try or check the inners and the outers. So if I use this top choice here, this inner would be 3 times 2t or 6t. And this outer would be 2t times 1 or 2t. And I can get a negative 8 out of that by using a minus in front of both of these. So it looks like this is going to factor into that GCF of 4, and then 2t minus 3, and 2t minus 1. And remember, this is set to 0. So now we have the right factors. The middle term checked out. A negative 3 times a negative 1 is a positive 3, and we got that 4t squared out front. So everything looks good. Now we're just ready to set each of these factors to 0. Now, this GCF, notice it does not have a variable in it. So when you try to set 4 to 0, that's not possible. So this GCF, because it doesn't have a variable, it doesn't contribute any solutions. It would only contribute a solution if you had also pulled out a T. Okay, So that 4 you don't have to worry about. But these two factors will contribute solutions because they have T's in them. So 2T minus 3 equals to 0 at 3 halves. And 2t minus 1 equals to 0 at 1 half. Do both of these answers make sense? And what kind of units would be on this? If you go back to the original problem, remember that initial velocity was 32 feet per second. So the units on time here are going to be seconds. And does it make sense for both of these to work? And if you visualize this picture, you'll see that it does. Because it takes half a second for the ball to hit 60 feet on the way up, but then it's going to hit it again on the way down. So this is time half a second, and this is 3 halves of a second. So it does make sense for there to be two solutions. OK? Now to finish the problem, it says it can be shown that the object reaches its maximum height after one second. What is the maximum height? So this time they're telling us a time and they're asking for a height. So they are telling us to let t be 1. So all we have to do is go back to this initial equation and plug in 1 for the time t and punch that into our calculator to figure out what the height h is. So this is actually a really simple problem to do because all I'm doing is plugging in 1 for the t. So that'll be negative 16 times 1 squared plus 32 times 1 and then plus 48. And so that's going to be negative 16 plus 32 plus 48 which is 16 plus 48 or 64, and the units on our height here were feet. So after one second, this ball 
is going to be 64 feet high and and t equals to one was halfway in between those 60 feet and so this is where it reaches its maximum height of 64 feet Okay, in our next example, we have a box with no top is to be constructed from a piece of cardboard whose length measures six inches more than its width. The box is to be formed by cutting squares that measure two inches on each side from the four corners and then folding up the sides. If the volume of the box will be 110 cubic inches, what are the dimensions of the piece of cardboard? So to start with, we are working with just a rectangular piece of cardboard. So it's going to look something like this. And what we're told is that the length down here is six inches more than its width. So if I think about that for a minute, I need to know the width first, and then the length would be six more than that. So for that reason, we're going to let this side be our x, and then the length would be six more than that, or x plus six. And then what we're doing to construct this box is we're going to cut four little squares from each of the four corners and each of these squares is two inches by two inches. So if we cut those squares out then we're going to be left with a shape like this and what we're going to do is fold up along these dashed lines to construct our box. So these flaps fold upwards and then this would turn into our box like this. So let's think about this. We're trying to find that the volume of the box will be 110 cubic inches. So what are the dimensions of the piece of cardboard? So we need to know what x is to get our dimensions. So how do you find the volume of a box? It's telling us that the volume of this box is supposed to be 110 cubic inches. So you should remember, hopefully from some geometry, that volume of a box is just length times width times height. So we want to use that to come up with an equation that we can solve for x. So in order to do that, we need to come up with what these dimensions of the box are in terms of the x's that we have over here. So let's think about this for a moment. If we're cutting out a square of two inches by two inches, that creates this little gap here. And when I fold this flap upwards, that height of that box is exactly this distance right here, which is two inches tall. So the height of my box over here is two inches. If I think about this length of my box over here, that comes from this length right here, which is the original x plus 6 with 2 inches taken away from this side and 2 inches taken away from this side. So it's really x plus 6 with 4 inches taken away total. So that would make a new dimension of x plus 2. So over here, our new length is x plus 2. In that same idea, the original width over here is, t is um, x, and then we're taking away 2 from the top and 2 from the bottom. So this distance from here to here is going to be the original x with 2 taken away from the top and the bottom, or a total of 4 taken away. So the width over here is x minus 4. So my length of my constructed box is x plus 2, my width is x minus 4, and my height is 2. So if I multiply those three things together, that's supposed to equal 110. So that's how we come up with our formula. So when I multiply these three things together, you can multiply in any order you like. So just to make this a little bit neater and cleaner, I'm going to put the 2 first, and then I'll do my x plus 2 and my x minus 4. So there's my length, my width, and a height all multiplied together, and that volume we were told was 110. So now this is the equation that we're really being asked to solve. And in order to solve it, we have to get a zero, bring everything over to one side so we can get that zero, so then we can factor and set each factor to zero. Now one thing you might notice right away 
is that this two divides evenly into 110. So if you want, you could divide both sides by two right away. And that helps simplify the equation slightly. Now we have x minus two times x minus four equals 55. But it's still not set to zero, so we're not really ready to solve this yet. Unfortunately, we have to foil out this whole left side, undo the parentheses, so that we can subtract the 55 over to the left side and get our zero. So let's FOIL on the left side. We're going to get x times x or x squared. x times a minus 4 is minus 4x. Plus 2 times x is positive 2x. And plus 2 times minus 4 is negative 8. So we have x squared, and then these two middle terms combine to a negative 2x, and then minus 8 equals 55. Now we're almost ready to get our 0. All we have to do now is subtract the 55 over, and that will give us x squared minus 2x minus 63 is equal to 0. Now once we have our 0, we're ready to factor. And this has three terms. There's no GCF. It's three terms with a leading coefficient of 1, so we're going to use reverse FOIL. It should be a slightly easier case because the leading coefficient is a 1. So there's only one way to get that x squared, and that would be x times x. And then we need two numbers that will multiply to a 63 and either add or subtract to give us a 2. Well, two numbers that multiply to 63 are 7 times 9, and they have a difference of 2. So that should work. So if I put 7 and 9, I need the bigger number to be the negative number so that I get a negative middle term. So I want the 9 to be minus and the 7 to be plus, and then this is equal to 0. So now that we have it factored, we're ready to set each factor to 0. So x plus 7 will be 0 when x is negative 7, and x minus 9 will equal to 0 when x is 9. Now remember, for word problems especially, there's always a context to the problem. And what this x represented was the length of the side of our original cardboard rectangle. And since these are lengths, it doesn't make sense for a length to be negative. So in the context of this problem, negative 7 is not going to be a solution. So we only want to use the 9, and the 9 would be this side over here which means the length would be 9 plus 6, or 15 inches on this side. So our dimensions are going to be 9 inches by 15 inches. And that's the volume, or that's the uh, dimensions of the piece of rectangle that we would need to start with in order to get a volume of 110 cubic inches. Okay, so to finish off our notes for today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what do you do if something doesn't um, factor? What do you do if you get a quadratic equation, you've worked hard to set it to zero, but you can't get it to factor? How do you finish solving for x? So the um, solution to that. There's multiple ways to solve equations, but in this case when we're talking about a quadratic equation, there is a nice formula, which I'm sure you've heard of before, called the quadratic formula, which enables us to solve any kind of quadratic equation that you could think of, whether it factors or not. Now, the good news is that this is a very powerful formula that works for every single problem. The bad news is that to solve it, we have to use a fairly complicated looking formula. And so that can get kind of tedious. And that's why we still learn how to solve quadratics using factoring. Because if something factors, then it's usually really quick to factor it and get a solution. But to apply the quadratic formula takes a little bit of time and a little bit of simplifying. So we usually try to avoid the quadratic formula if we can, but sometimes we don't have any alternative if our original polynomial doesn't factor. So this is what the quadratic formula says. It says if you have a quadratic equation of the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals to 0, there's supposed to be a 0 here, then the solutions to this equation have this form. x equals 
negative b, or the opposite of b, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now this is a formula that you're going to use throughout your math career. So if you're going on to take any future math classes, you're going to see this formula and have to use it quite often. So it's a good formula to just set to your memory and make sure that you know how to use it and simplify it. So we're going to practice a few problems and basically just learn how to apply this formula. So on our first example, we have the equation x squared minus 4 equals to 2x. And in order to solve this, the first thing we want to do is realize that we have to get that 0. No matter whether we factor or use the quadratic formula, in both cases you always must get your equation set to 0 first. So I want to do that here. Now when I do that, I'm going to subtract the 2x to the other side. Now it's important, especially if you're going to do the quadratic formula and even when you're factoring, it's important to put your polynomial in descending order so that you can correctly identify what your middle term is, what your a, your b, and your c are. So when I move this 2x over, make sure that you squeeze it in between the x squared and the 4. So this equation now becomes x squared minus 2x minus 4 equals to 0. Now the first thing that I would do to solve this is I would do a really quick check to see is this going to factor because if it does factor we're done. We can get our solutions very quickly. So it has three terms and I would try reverse foiling and there's only one way to get an x and an x and to get a 4 there's a couple of ways. There's 2 and 2 which won't give me a middle term of 2 in the middle so that won't work or there's 4 and 1 or 1 and 4, and if I add those I'd get a 5, if I subtracted those I'd get a 3, but they're not going to give me a 2 that I need in that middle term. So for this reason, we can see that x squared minus 2x minus 4 does not factor. And so that's why we would pull this quadratic formula out of our pocket and use it to solve this equation. So when we do that, we have to correctly identify what's the a, what's the b, and what's the c that we need to use in this big complicated formula. The a here is your coefficient of your x squared. So in this problem, that's a 1. Your b is your coefficient of your x term. So in this problem, that's a negative 2. And your c is your constant term, which in this problem is negative 4. So now, if I apply my quadratic formula, and it's this guy up here, we're going to say that the solutions x should be the opposite of b. So the opposite of negative 2 would be positive 2, plus or minus the square root of the b squared. Now when you square the b, use parentheses. You have to square both the 2 and the negative. So that'll become a positive 4. So there's your b squared, minus 4 times a, a was 1, and c was negative 4. So there's my b squared minus 4ac, and then I want all of this over 2 times a, 2 times 1. And so now we just have to do a little bit of simplifying. So I'm going to start by 2 times 1 in the bottom is just a 2, and now let's talk about under that radical. Negative 2 squared becomes a positive 4. A negative 4 times a 1 times a negative 4 becomes a positive 16. So this becomes x equals 2 plus or minus the square root of 20 all over 2. Now you could leave your answer like this in mathematics. We would actually say that the square root of 20 is not really considered to be reduced. And you would have to know a little bit about square roots in order to simplify this. So this is valid and you could type this into your calculator and get some decimal values for it as well. Or if you did want to reduce it, you'd have to recognize that the square root of 20 is actually the square root of 4 times the square root of 5, and the square root of 4 we know is just 2. So square root of 20 actually reduces to 2 root 5, and that means that all these outer numbers 
are going to reduce as well because 2 divided by 2 just goes to 1 and 2 root 5 divided by 2 just goes to root 5. So the more simplified answer would be 1 plus or minus root 5. And recognize that that's actually two answers because that's going to be 1 plus square root of 5 or 1 minus square root of 5. And you could get decimal values for those by just punching that into your calculator. Most of the time, we want to just know our solutions in exact form, which would be this case. And sometimes we want decimal approximations. And then in that situation, and that would probably most likely be the case if you had a word problem, you would want to write your answer in its decimal form instead of as its exact form. So it depends on the problem. Just make sure you read the directions carefully or ask your instructor if you're not sure whether you should give it in exact form or as a decimal but I would just accept 1 plus or minus root 5. Okay, let's try another example. So on this one, we have 9x squared minus 12x plus 4 equals to 0. So if we just jump in right away and we try our quadratic formula on this, the a would be the 9, the b would be this middle coefficient or negative 12, and the c would be the 4. So according to the quadratic formula, x is equal to the opposite of b. So the opposite of negative 12 becomes positive 12, plus or minus the square root of b squared, use parentheses, so negative 12 quantity squared, minus 4 times a, which is 9, times c, which is 4, and then it's all of this over 2 times a, so 2 times 9. So when we go to simplify, the denominator just simplifies to an 18, and the numerator, we're going to get negative 12 quantity squared, which is 144, and then a minus 4 times a 9 is a 36, and 36 times a 4 is also 144. So this is actually 144 minus 144, which that just goes to 0. And the square root of 0 is just 0, so the top just goes to 12. This goes away, and we just get 12 over 18. That's not reduced. I can divide both of those by a 6. So if I divide by 6, I'm going to get 2 thirds. So we actually only ended up with one single answer, and it was equal to 2 thirds. So that's kind of weird. So if we think about why that might be, remember when we did this problem, we just jumped right in and we started using the quadratic formula right away. We didn't bother to see if this would factor. So let's back up a minute and let's see, does this guy factor? It's got three terms, there's no GCF, so we'd have to try reverse FOIL. And if I use two sets of parentheses, there's multiple ways to get 9x squared, but I'm going to guess that it's a 3x times a 3x. And there's multiple ways to get a 4, but I'm going to guess that it's 2 and 2. And let's see why this works. If I do 2 times 3x, I'm going to get a 6x in the middle, and another 6x in the middle, and I want a negative 12x in the middle, so let's make both of these minus and that gives me 9x squared, it gives me the minus 12x in the middle that I want, and a negative 2 times a negative 2 is a positive 4. So this actually did factor right from the start. And if I set each of these factors to 0, they're the same, so I'm going to get the same answer for both of them, you'll see that you get that 2 thirds. And so that typically will happen. If you get an answer that's a nice fractional answer or a nice integer answer, then chances are you probably could have factored the equation right from the start instead of having to use the quadratic formula. Okay. So our last example today is going to be 3x squared minus x equals to 7. And so as always, with all of these equations, we always want to get our 0 first. So the first thing that I would want to do is move that 7 over and subtract it to the left side. So if I subtract 7, here's my new quadratic equation. And that doesn't really have a lot of potential for factoring. Uh, we know that there's only one way to get 
a 3x squared. That would be 3x and x. And there's only one way to get 7, but it would either be a 7 here and a 1 here, or a 1 here and a 7 here. And if you check those inners and those outers, you're not going to get a negative 1 in the middle. So this guy doesn't factor. And so as a result of that, the only option we have is to use our quadratic formula. So a here is 3. The b that we're going to use is this coefficient negative 1. And the c that we're going to use, remember we had to subtract that c over to the other side. Our c is actually negative 7. So applying our quadratic formula, x equals minus b, or the opposite of b, which would be negative 1. The opposite of that becomes positive 1, plus or minus the square root of our b squared, so quantity negative 1 squared, minus 4 times a, which was 3, times c, which was negative 7. Be really careful with your negatives here. All over 2 times a, 2 times 3. And now if I go to simplify this, the denominator just becomes a 6. And under the radical, negative 1 quantity squared becomes a positive 1. And then 4 times 3 is 12. 12 times 7 is 84. And a negative times a negative is going to make this a positive 84. And so then when I go to simplify under that radical, I get 1 plus or minus the square root of 85 all over 6. And that's two different solutions. That's 1 plus root 85 all over 6 and 1 minus root 85 all over 6. And the square root of 85 does not reduce. It doesn't have any perfect squares that go into it. So that's why I can stop here. And this is considered my exact solution. And if you needed a decimal, then you would just type in 1 plus square root of 85, hit enter, and then divide that answer by 6. And then do it again, but do 1 minus square root of 85, hit enter, and then divide that answer by 6. All right, that concludes our video lecture on solving equations by factoring and the quadratic formula. Good luck.